Welcome viewers, it's another episode of our program, Catholicism and You, on Lumen Christi Television Network. I am Reverend Father Panaki Bede. Our first question today is, what are the correct postures during the Eucharistic prayer? The Eucharistic prayers are those prayers offered during the Mass. The Mass is referred to as an enacted ritual and is basically an action, an experience of salvation. It's not an idea or the process of thinking about salvation. It is God's saving present and sanctifying action made real for us here and now. We call it a ritual in the sense that what we do in the liturgy is structured. It's something organized in a particular pattern which is always repeated in the same way. And as such, everybody becomes familiar with it. In other words, everybody knows how to participate by words, gestures, actions because they don't change. That's why we call it a ritual. One of the reasons why I find the phrase enacted ritual useful is that this phrase shows the fact that all who participate in our liturgy do it as humans with their minds, their hearts and their whole body. Our bodily actions therefore gestures and processions at mass all reflects the fact that we are human beings, we are alive. It's a sign that everything about us is active and that we use our bodies at mass to reflect just who we are. The way we act in the human life through our speech, feelings, gestures and movement is the same way we act in our liturgy. We use all our human faculties in the liturgy in such a way that the liturgy respects who we are as humans and in fact it emphasizes who we are as human beings and flesh because the way we honor God is through the very gifts God himself has given to us through our body our mind and our heart now when you apply this to the maps what is clear is that the way we use our bodies reflect the way we look at ourselves before God. What we do in the liturgy makes a theological sense. Therefore, it is important to understand what believers in generation before us thought about the Mass as they engage in it in its various ritual gestures. We learn, for instance, that in the early church, the earliest Christians, through the early Middle Age, stood, they used to stand during their Eucharistic prayer. We need to look at their teaching about the Eucharist to understand the relationship between the posture and the theology, which is the study of God. In those days, standing was a sign of attention. It was a sign of respect. And from the angle of the church, it was a sign that we have risen with Christ as resurrected and redeemed people. As such, the Eucharist is referred to as an act of a pilgrim church, people who are still struggling on earth, raising their minds and hearts and bodies in communal praise and thanksgiving. Sometimes, standing was accompanied with the raising of hands in prayer, which we always call the position of orans, which is a praying position. Hence, in this our own century and in the century that precedes those of the early Christian, standing and raising of hands in Eucharistic prayer signified the attitude that the church was on its way to the kingdom and that the Mass was a time for everybody to join through words and gesture to the praise and thanks 
of God together. By the time of the Middle Age, during the time of the Middle Ages, you know, some changes had occurred in the church, which affected the postures too. The postures also adopted at mass. For instance, beginning from the 9th century, those who studied theology started a debate about what the Eucharist was and how best to describe the changes from bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. At the same time, the people of God began to revere the host and the chalice with gestures of reverence. So did the priest. Hence, we find more attention given to describe what the Eucharistic species of consecrated bread and wine was and the positive effects it would give to us more and more the words came to be recited softly eventually it was said in silence and at the time at this time the ritual gestures of the priest developed to show reference to consecrated bread and wine namely he would genuflect before them and eventually raise them up for all to see. In fact, the main reason why the people wanted to see the host and the chalice was that they no longer received communion regularly at Mass. So they felt that this substituted that aspect of receiving communion. So we call it the ocular communion, that is, for the eyes. It would at least satisfy their spiritual quest. After all, if they don't receive Jesus, they can at least see him. What is important about those gestures is that they also reflect the way human beings communicate. Holding the Eucharist and the chalice for people to see and the act of seeing by those people. Everything, its emphasis was placed on the fact that the sacrifice was an unbloody, uh, unbloody sacrifice on Calvary. The whole mass is an unbloody sacrifice on Calvary, which we were privileged to experience. And as such, the Eucharist was so wholesome that people watched it as spectator from the Middle Ages on. It's no surprise, therefore, that they stressed on kneeling as a sign of adoration. Now, let me make a distinction here between gestures during the Eucharistic prayer at Mass and gestures at other times. We have evidence that even from even people stood for the Eucharist in the early church, they would bow or prostrate themselves at other times at certain liturgies specifically on Good Friday, for instance. You see, the priest will come out and he'll prostrate in front of the church. During the veneration of the cross, you see them kissing the cross, making a form of gesture. This precedent then led to the custom of bowing before the Eucharist when people venerated it outside of Mass. Therefore, we need to keep in mind at some point, as some gestures are fitting for devotion, outside of the mass may not be fitting for the mass itself because devotions are to the eucharistic species reserved for communion and adoration whereas postures assumed at mass should reflect the theology the study of god of the eucharistic action at that moment that this leads finally to the present state of the reform we have today. For instance, the general instruction of the Roman Mister, where we have all the rules guiding us on how we need to participate at Mass. The people should stand most of the time during Mass and should kneel or genuflect at the consecration unless present, prevented by the lack of space or perhaps the presence of a large number of people, or some other reasonable cause. Now, let us put this direction in relation to the restored mass.
cleric, the revised text of the prayers at Mass reflect an emphasis both on Mass as an action in which we participate as Christ's sacrifice given to us. The very fact that the second Eucharistic prayer from one of our early church fathers, Hippolytus, in the third century states, We thank you for counting us worthy to stand here and serve you. So there is an indication of standing as a posture of a people of God struggling to attain eternal life. Also, the emphasis on the Mass now is towards fostering our relationship with one another in the community and sharing the Eucharist in communion. Then we have added the gestures of processing to communion as an important ritual, important ritual gesture for the whole community. But what happens to the Missa's instruction about standing and kneeling, genuflecting as consecration only? Well, it's another instance where we are taught that when you are in Rome, behave like the Romans. The church does throughout the world and is not always uniform because of the phrasing of the general instruction of the Roman Missa. Namely, unless other provisions are made and for some reasonable cause, the decision about posture during the Eucharistic prayer was left to the bishop of each country to decide. It means therefore that what we do at Mass will now be determined by the bishop of our local area depending on our culture and on the psyche of the people. When the new Missal was published, the Bishop Conference of Belgium, for instance, the Netherlands, France, and some sector of the French-speaking Canada area opted for standing throughout the Eucharistic prayer. The bishops of Spain, however, and Italy adopted the prescribed literature and the prescribed posture from the literature. That is why till this day the major basilicas in Rome, like St. Peter's Basilica, you will never find kneelers and that people stand at the Eucharistic prayers, but they kneel during consecration and resume standing for the memorial acclamations. The African bishops, on the other hand, follow the practice that was customary for weekdays in Advent, Lent, and other fast days as seen in the Tridentine rite, namely, to kneel from the sanctus from the holy holy until after the great amen to conclude my experience of that ritual gesture of standing is to enable people to engage in the eucharistic prayer in a special way it captures our mind and our heart as the prayer of praise and thanksgiving of a pilgrim church in a way that is not always common with people kneeling for this prayer. In most parishes, there is a distinct change in attention and focus when people kneel after the holy, holy, holy. What happens often when people kneel is that they bow their heads in reference and adoration and seems to be less engaged in the words and actions of the Eucharistic prayer and the Eucharistic action itself. You see, when some people bow, in the process of bowing down, they even slip off. So the process of standing helps the human person to be active and to participate. We shall quickly go for a short break. When we return, we shall be treating another interesting question. Don't go away. By the truth about God who created and redeemed us. By the truth about a human person made in the image and likeness of God, destined for a glorious fulfillment 
in the kingdom to come. Always be convincing witnesses to the truth. Stir into flame the gift of God that has been bestowed upon you in baptism. Light your nation, light the world with the power of that flame. Amen. Just before the break, we took a quest we took a look at the question what actually is the correct posture during the Eucharistic prayer? And we said the correct posture is standing at some point and kneeling at other points and we get to stand. Now we take a look at another question. Why don't we say for thy kingdom come? The power and glory are yours right after the Our Father. The glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The kingdom, the power, the glory, these are technically called the doxology. The reason why we don't say it immediately after the Lord's Prayer is historical. The difference has to do with or its cost based on translation of the New Testament from its original Greek into other languages, specifically the German and the Latin. At the time of the Reformation, during the time of Martin Luther, Martin Luther took the great task of translating the Greek New Testament into the German language. And what he did was to add the doxology as the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer. However, when St. Jerome, a biblical scholar too, came and translated the Greek New Testament into Latin, what we call today the Vulgate translation. He did not include the doxology to the end of the Lord's Prayer. So from the time of Saint Jerome on, Catholics translated the scripture from the Vulgate, the Latin translation. So it was not surprising that the doxology was not included in such translation. At the risk of oversimplification, we might say that what was thought to be a Protestant Catholic split, the difference that occurs between the Protestant churches and the Catholic Church, was really not a matter of whose scripture, scriptural translation was used. If you use St. Jerome's translation, there will be no doxology. If you use Luther's translation, there was doxology. This was not a problem over the centuries before now. It became only a problem recently. So in ancient time, they, didn't, they never had any issues about this. It just depends on whose translation you are using. But the church chose to use St. Jerome's translation. Now, to answer your first question, why the bishop have adopted a number of subjections, put forth for the common test? Why did we choose this one over this one? They have not ad adopted the ecumenical translation of the Lost Prayer. One will ask why. One will have expected that 
they pick a version of the scripture that will synchronize that everybody will be at home with. Certainly, it is not to diminish the value of prayers that the Christian churches have in common. It is really a pastoral judgment. The fact that people know this prayer by heart and have been taught the present phrasing in the Misa led to the bishops to judge it best to keep it as it was. Now, with regards to the seeming dislocation, of the doxology of the Catholic Mass, as opposed to saying it immediately at the end of the Lord's Prayer. Let me offer a bit of history. At the final words of the Lord's Prayer in the Roman Rite, the book that contains our celebration, but deliver us from evil, it was customary a kind of tradition for the priest or the bishop to explain or make a little bit of explanation on this phrase that came to be called the embolism of our father. This drew out one or two things from the previous phase and the light of the feast of the season or in the light of the fact that we are about to exchange a sign of peace. Therefore, what gradually emerged in the Roman rite was the establishment of a rather fixed pattern that we now hear in the Revised Mass. Its first words picked up on the previous words of our Father, that is, Deliver us from evil leads to deliver us from every evil. The petition to grant us peace in our days is a subtle introduction to the sign of peace that follows. The time frame as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ, is particularly significant. As once again, it kind of gives us an idea of something that has not taken place. What the future will look like. So technically we talk about something eschatological. Something that has to do with the end that has not taken place. And this thing has to, it characterizes our worship and the whole of the Christian life. We are wait. Christ return in glory at the end of time to bring the temporal world to an end. Recall the acclamation, Lord Jesus, come in glory. How fitting, therefore, that the song of praise, technically called the doxology, itself should end with now and forever and ever. Apart from these differences, or despite the differences of exactly where the doxology occurs, I think it must be admitted that its insertion into the missile so everyone can hear is important. And the addition of the song of praise for all to pray is also a significant step towards ecumenical union. Why we, we, we look at the fact that perhaps one day they will get to add it so that it can be a form of unifying aspect for all Christians. It's not to diminish one church against the other, but basically because of the translation from which they pick it from that makes the difference. Viewers, here we draw a curtain on today's episode, and I believe you had a wonderful time staying with us. If there are anything bothering you, questions, or certain things you do not understand, and you want a kind of clarification, you can kindly send your comments or your suggestions to the numbers on the screen, or you can send to the email also on the screen. 
until another time i say i remain reverend father panaki obede god bless you <laughs>